Is this is, is this thing on? Are we live? Yes, we're live. We're doing it live. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's up, everybody? My name is Christo. I'm just kidding. I'm not Christo. My name is Greg. And who am I? And what am I? What am I doing here on your YouTube screen? Um, it's a long, funny, funny story that we don't have time to get into right now. But I am I'm here to introduce our live stream guest today and and go over what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to mess this up. Okay, so <laughs> I just want everyone to know that everyone, I think everyone is cool out there. Everyone knows we're us. laughing here in the other room. And, we're, uh, <laughs> we're here for the crash and burn, as is everybody. Yeah. So if, if you like to watch train wrecks, you, you are in the right in the right place right here right now. Um, and you're just gonna have to deal with it. So welcome. <laughs> On that note, welcome, everyone. Um, <laughs> so today's today's topic and guest topic is, is the sky falling or is this the gold rush? And today we're going to talk with creative director Ryan Summers about Ooh. the state of the motion graphic industry, Ooh. remote graphic Ooh. industry. Also, first time seeing this deck, so I'm just <laughs> winging it. All right. <laughs> Love it. Here we go. Sky falling or gold rush? Just said that. Let's move to the next slide. We're going to talk about burnout, apparently. We're going to talk about trend chasing and trend making. Can you tell I'm a natural? Living in public, social media or self-promotion? I'm assuming we're going to talk more about that too, based on what I'm reading here. <laughs> okay, now, finally, some, something interesting here. Our guest on today's show, Ryan Summers. <laughs> can, we, can we cut to Ryan real quick? Let's, let's There is Ryan. Hey, <laughs> little awesome here. Here. There is. is definitely falling right now. Yeah. In the in this booth on this live stream, <laughs> everything's collapsing. And it's all right. All right. It's so, kind of. I'm gonna do this weird thing where I'm gonna talk about you like I know you because I did a bunch of research or Chris did a bunch right. of research, and we're gonna tell everyone. <laughs> so Ryan, and please correct me if any of this is wrong. Right, right put your names. Um, Ryan, you are a creative director at Digital Kitchen in Chicago. Before correct. that, you were a director and an animator at Imaginary Forces. Yes. Before that. You were an After Effects editor on Talking Dead. That's awesome, by the way. I, I didn't know that. Very cool. Yeah, there's a good story about that that I can't tell live, but I can tell you in person. Fair enough. All right. Um, MoGraph artist this week in. I don't know what that means. Can, we, did I get that right? Yeah, that's correct. The okay. words are correct. Okay, cool. Um, adjunct faculty at Columbia College Chicago. A while ago, yeah. A while ago. Yeah, I think we're going backwards in time as we go we're down through back. this list. All right. And um, it seems like it all started with you getting your BA in the Illinois Art Institute. Yes. And, and uh, let's say, let's pull one out for that school because they just uh, closed that entire branch. So I'm oh, man. a school that doesn't exist, which is actually feels pretty good. Wow. That's, that's wild. You're, you're, like a, you're like a piece of DNA from that school that's just going to kind of continue yeah. the, the legacy. The important thing, I paid off my loans before they closed, so that's all that matters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, right. hot topic, hot topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another topic for another day. <laughs> right on. There's plenty to go on. Very cool. Well, um, so this is my first time hosting this live stream, and um, I'm, I'm kind of I'm winging it with this deck here, but the next slide I'm seeing says questions. So I, I, I assume, like, let's just jump into some questions. Let's just talk about the industry. How's right? the industry for yeah. everybody? Well, well, I mean... To be to be totally fair, I you, you and I kind of I, I feel like we're coming up or I think are around the same time in the MoGraph industry, and <laughs> we, we've we've since kind of taken different paths as to where we are now. To be yeah. honest, like I haven't done a pitch in at least a year, maybe two. Yeah. You know. How does that feel? I feel like this is therapy time for Craig. Craig, how does that make you feel? Well, <laughs> <laughs> this is not about me, right? This is not about. How do you me. feel? How do you feel telling other people how to pitch, even though you haven't pitched in about a year? <laughs> does it make uh, you feel good, or does it make you feel bad? <laughs> I think that's a loaded question. <laughs> that's so no, I, I I'm not telling people how to pitch at all. I know, um, I know. I'm just giving you a hard time. Th there are, yeah. <laughs> Okay. I laugh when I'm uncomfortable. In case anyone in chat like can't figure that out, this is this is what's happening. <laughs> well, um, let's let's let, let's start with the the opening question, right? Like the the thing that we kind of launched with is like just the state of just the design, motion graphics industry, all the kind of creative industries right now. Like you guys are a great example of somebody who's left kind of like 
the motion design industry to, to go more educational. Do you feel like part of the motivation for doing that was because this guy was falling or did you see a gold rush on this kind of YouTube thought leader educational side? Mm. I, I think maybe a, a little bit of both, you know, and everyone, I, I can only speak for, for me. I, I think everyone has a, a slightly different feeling and, and opinion uh, about that. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, there's, there's this idea of like a, a higher purpose and, you know, it, it, at the very beginning of, of your career, you, you kind of just want to make the coolest stuff possible. You don't really care about the, the money so much. It's all about this creative cachet. And um, I, I think over time, as you do this for like a decade or decades, the 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 value in that, or I, I guess where you assign value starts to change over time. And I, I think um, that happened for a, a lot of us here. Um, it certainly happened uh, for me, you know, the, the types of projects I would get excited about weren't the same as they were, you know, when, when I first started. And mm -hmm you know, you throw in the recession and you throw in uh, maturity and everything else and, and you're just kind of like, well, why am I doing this? What, what's, am I really doing anything good and of value and do I want to do this for another 10 years and how does, how does that work? Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know fundamentally, you know, like why, why the future was started versus not continuing down a, a path of service work, you know? I, I think Chris would be a better person to speak to that, but um, in terms of how I feel about it, it's, it's liberating. Mm -hmm. it, it's wonderful. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of weird because I, I feel like we're all working in house now for ourselves. So we are the ones hiring ourselves. We are the client. We are the, the agency. We are the animator, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're doing all these things and it's kind of just like circulating internally. Um, right. and it's really great. You know, mm -hmm. there is no deadline unless we want one. There's right. no budget necessarily. I mean, there's time, but but that's kind of it. So mm -hmm. yeah, we're we're in a very different place than I it, it, I believe it, it sounds like you are. At, you know, at, at DK, um, what is it? What is it like on the other side now? <laughs> um, we could either start off and say it's horrible and everything's falling. Big companies are dying. The budgets are getting smaller. The requests are getting higher. We can't find people. Or I could say we have more work than uh, we've ever had before, and uh, I can't uh, find enough people to do the jobs because the the stream of work coming in is so crazy. Um, I can't find enough people to hire because we, there, you know, there's so much out there. It seems we it's true both ways. And as I talk to more and more people out in the industry, um, whether you're a, a single freelancer, you're part of a collective, um, you're just getting into the industry. Um, it seems to go week by week, month by month. It seems to be different in geographical locations. Um, I feel like we're in a huge transition state, to be honest. Um, I think a lot more people are actually in the same position that you guys are in, to be honest. Um, there's a lot of people that are looking to see, how do I do my own thing? How do I um, find ways to set deadlines? A lot more than when you and I, Greg, got started. Mm -hmm. You know, It was either start a big company and look for big you know, budgets, look for big clients, or go to a company that had those. And those are really your only two options. So I feel like the the playing field is so much more varied now for what you can do, where you can work, what part of even motion design you want to get into. Are you in interactive? Are you in um, UI UX? Are you in just straight up, you know, production that you're doing effects for, you know, live action commercials? Are you doing explainer videos? Like the field is so much wider. Um, at the same time, I feel like there's always this downward pressure coming down to get done faster for less money and in quicker turnarounds. Um, it feels like at a large company that's starting to get um, past the point of sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess on the other side, though, too, I think we've seen um, historic amounts of people staying at a company for a really long time. I feel like normally the boom bust cycle is you get into a company, two or three free or two or three creative directors build their way up, and then sooner or later someone leaves, right? You know, like someone mm -hmm. says, "I can do better. I can do it for more money. I can get my share of you know the money coming in versus going to overhead." Um, and I feel like we've seen a lot of people stay at, at like, you know, big shops, whether it's New York or L.A. or, you know, in, in other countries. Um, I do feel like we've seen just a very big change. I, I, I took some notes. I feel like in just the last um, the last few months, in the last like couple of weeks, uh, Patrick Clare leaving Elastic. Ooh. Jason. Yeah. Jason wow. Whitmore. In we are Royale. That was, um, yeah. Michelle, you know, Michelle Doherty just left Imaginary Forces. Um, even all the way down to like like a place like Grayscale Gorilla, Chris Schmidt. 
um, mm -hmm. who was one of the most you know the influential people at the company tool development was there for quite a long time just left a few weeks ago and today just announced i think it's called rocket lasso um his new initiative a patreon backed kind of subscription-based tool development educational thing um so i feel like all of a sudden that that pressure of like keeping everything together and holding stuff that normally every year or two you get this boom bust cycle of people starting over from scratch um it's been kind of being contained for a long time maybe because of the recession maybe because of other forces in the industry but i feel like there's been this huge explosion of long-time players and new people all kind of going off and leaving and starting their own thing so i mean if you ask chris it's probably part of the natural cycle but it just feels like it's accelerated right now yeah uh, absolutely. I, I've noticed that too. Uh, I've seen a lot of new Patreons uh, popping up and people just kind of doing their own thing. And it, it's not like um, I'm a freelancer, hire me as a lone, a lone wolf. It's more of like, no, I'm developing my own community and my own systems and my own um, kind of small business. You know, maybe there's some service work involved, but it's not entirely that. There's a lot of other options on the menu if, if you want mm -hmm. to participate and, and be part of that. Yeah, and I think I think right now we're in the gold rush days too, right? And like you guys obviously got ahead of the curve, and and you know between the school and the future, those those are ideas that have been sitting there for a long time, waiting for the audiences and the honestly like the the delivery mechanisms to make it available. But now between um, Patreon, Kickstarter, YouTube, um, a bunch of different ways to be able to support people, mm -hmm. um, make it Gumroad. You know, there, there's great tutorials out there and great you know brushes and um, texture packs. You know, there's millions of ways to reach an audience now. Um, I feel like the gold rush is there to fill up that space, but at some point the question is, will we hit kind of um, peak subscription or peak uh, thought leader, and there just won't mm -hmm. be as much for, for all these people. Um, you've, you see like the social social media world um, where you know, you know the Casey Neistats and the, the Peter McKinnons of the world, and then there's kind of the, the throngs of people chasing that gold. Um, and then at some point it's like, okay, there's, there's too many people and whatever it might be, lifestyle or camera or whatever kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The thing that's interesting is there there is only so much oxygen in the motion design industry to start selling people um, education and like basic tools. I do think there is an untapped resource for the stuff we make for other people, making it for ourselves. You know, like we make content, we make characters, we tell stories, we create brands. I don't see a lot of people in motion design specifically making that kind of stuff yet. And that's obviously because it's a bigger, you know, runway that you need to kind of get it going. Um, but I'm hoping we see what's starting to happen in kind of um, the animation industry. People that have been at Pixar for 15 years are leaving and starting VR animation companies or other things that take their skill set, take their narrative skills, and then they're making their own products. You know, and they're not just educational projects, the products, their they're brands, their IPs, their stories. Um, you see it in comic books. I, I use this often a lot, but if you love comic books, um, the, the what happened in the industry 20 years ago with Image Comics is basically mm -hmm. rewriting self-publishing in the comic book world, and now we're seeing the payoff that it's hitting pop culture. You know, something mm -hmm. like The Walking Dead um, only exists because a bunch of guys at Marvel left and started a creator-owned company. Um, I'd love to see more of that happening in motion design. I'd love to see, you know. I think of someone like Sarah Beth Morgan, who is an amazing illustrator, does tons of work for tons of brands. I'd love to see her start um, her own line of merchandise, right? Like wh whatever it might be. I, I look at a guy like um, Mr. Jake Parker, who um, does a lot of stuff with uh, beginning kind of comic book artists trying to create their own brands, you know, away from comic books. And th there's a ton of great initiatives there. I, I don't see why we can't do it in motion design. You know, there's amazing storytellers, animators, designers, editors, um, but we're always just in service. I, I hate that word, service. We're always in service for other people. <laughs> I don't understand why we can't be in service more for ourselves. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think, like you said, it's it's the gold rush now, now's a good time because you don't need a, a computer the size of a Cadillac to make really great 3D renders and beautiful characters like Pixar-esque. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can do that your junior year at, at some colleges, and, you know, it's like, push the button, mm -hmm. there you go. Um, so how, how do we go about that, Ryan? Like, what, what, what do you think? Because I'm imagining, okay, if, if I'm out there and I'm, I'm, you know, a few years into my career as, as a motion designer and mm -hmm. I have higher aspirations, I'm like, I don't want to do this service work forever. Mm -hmm. what, I, I want to tell my own story. How, you know, what is that next step? Where, how, how, do you, how do you see that playing out? I mean, I think it's, I think it's getting your head out of um, the motion design uh, echo chamber. You know, like, like in terms of chasing the same stuff that everybody chases. You know, I, I feel like you guys are doing a great job of showing the example. You know, learning more about entrepreneurship, learn more about audience 
development, learn more about branding, but branding yourself. Um, I mean, I think we're in a world where you can freelance remotely for anyone, anywhere, um, but there's no reason you couldn't remotely freelance for yourself at the same time. Um, I think people are really scared to do it. Um, I think we're also kind of just at the bleeding edge of like what's possible. So the, the industry leaders, the people who are the, the top names, they're not going to stop working for, for Google or for odd fellows because of the potential for whatever it might be, income or supporting their families, that's huge. It's going to take the generation of people who are just kind of learning right now and are seeing people with Instagram followings and people with YouTube followings making money just by being themselves, not even making anything, um, realizing that they can take the energy and time that they would have spent working for those companies we talked about, um, but working for themselves. Um, the thing that's really exciting about it is that, you know, it, we saw the same thing in the music industry, right? Like in the 80s, if um, the Rolling Stones or Bruce Springsteen or Madonna showed up, the whole town, your whole city stopped and everybody went to the largest stadium and they watched that one person play with 65,000 people in the arena. That doesn't happen anymore or very, very little. You know, there's a lot more music for a, mo a lot more niches um, for much smaller audiences. But if you are the musician and you know how to speak to the people that want you to succeed, you can have a very healthy lifestyle. We see it all the time where people aren't signed to labels. They make their own music. They produce their own stuff. They sell their own merchandise. And they have a direct dialogue with their fans. I still say it again. Like, I don't understand why you can't do that in motion graphics, why, why you can't have that same set of um, following, that same set of like, you have this additional kind of component of people who aspirationally also want to be like you and you can directly teach them while you're making your thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost like it, it's almost like the projects just kind of could theoretically replenish themselves. You make something, you sell the product, you show people, then you tell people how you did it while you're making the next one. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I haven't seen anybody really do it. I think the best person, it's also caused a lot of issues, but when you look at what somebody like Beeple's done, right? Like he does mm -hmm. one a days, but the amount of narrative potential that you see in his images day to day, it's almost like seeing a comic strip when I look at his stuff. Yeah. yeah. I've been on the been on the Brograph podcast several times and they do this whole thing called Beeple's Peoples where they invite people to actually make up the story that happens behind the scenes of his <laughs> Wow. And that, and that's that, that's awesome. like people. That that's like user generated content. That's yeah. not even people saying what it is. But you know, that's what I mean. Like like that stuff, I mean he's generated enough of an audience and such a following and he has the content there that you know he's getting you know major labels to put his t his artwork on t shirts and selling them. Mm -hmm. You know like that's one person, granted, again, it's one person with an incredible work ethic and a great artistic sensibility. But there's no reason you can't do that at a smaller scale while you're also freelancing. Right. Yeah, sort of supplement that that income. Um, I, I think everyone finds the concept of, of passive income very appealing. Um, it's, it's tough to do as, I, I, I think, a freelancer because you're trying to figure out how to... Um, balance your time, you know, and, and ensure, okay, I have bills to pay a mortgage or whatever money's coming in. And at, at the same time, you know, sort of develop something new and it's a big risk and you're not sure if this is going to pay out. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. But you know what? I, I, I always think there's always more time, man. I think there's always more time. I, I've had this conversation with some people in the industry that have worked for, you know, quite a while. And they tell me, you know, I don't have enough time. I'm doing this. But then at the same time, those are the same people that I see on every Slack, every message board, commenting on YouTube, on Twitter. Like, like they're spending their time, but they're just spreading. I, th there's a great book called Deep Work. And I, I feel like in our industry, there's a lot of, um, you feel really good, but from the shallow work, right? Like the fast food work. You, mm -hmm. You're like, oh, I, I mentioned this thing on Twitter and it got 12 likes and I did two more drawings and I put them on Instagram. And then like, it, like there's a lot of, the, the, the feedback loop is really short on fast food efforts, right? Mm -hmm. But they don't go to anything. They don't build anything. Um, and I, I think people have tricked themselves. I, I believe in imposter syndrome. I believe in inspiration paralysis, but I also believe that like that is your body or your artistic kind of spirit saying, wake the fuck up, sorry. Wait, wake up! I'm just gonna, I, I, I'm giving you a Gary V uh, warm up. It's a warm yeah, up. yeah. You're prepping the, everyone. I, yeah, let me all know you're gonna get 20 of those a second versus my. Yeah, um, but I, I do think a certain amount of it is like your artistic ego saying, "Man, oh, this stuff is so great. I'll never be like that." And the normal reaction is to say, "Now I'll step towards it, or I'll find somebody who can help me." But I think there's also so much going through. That's why I say, like, detach from the echo chamber a little bit. Find ways mm -hmm. to create some space and create some emptiness so that you can actually make something, you can create something. You can find out what it is you don't want to do. Like I, I talk about voice and vision a lot. I teach at MoGraph Mentor. I'm you know, setting something up for another place. And, and, and voice and vision is something that's super nebulous. And it doesn't mean like become a creative director and never get on a box again. But like you, you have an artistic life and an artistic career. You don't have to just do what 
people say you need to do to make you know make a living and pay your rent you can be very choosy about the types of jobs you take i have, I have a great friend named jordan scott who he doesn't work on jobs that do, it doesn't connect to what he does or what he cares about like whether it's a, a brand or an assignment like i've seen him go to a company before and within two days of like you know what i need to be off this job because it, it, it's not right for me and he'll help them find somebody else but you know he doesn't take first holds he just takes bookings you know you can write your own rules mm -hmm how you work in the industry there are no rules at all you know there's just do good work always be helping people and communicate clearly and have transparency those are really the only rules as a, as a freelancer or as an artist in the industry you can do everything else you want you can make your own rules ryan i got a question for you can uh -oh. you hear me can you guys yeah, hear yeah. me oh man is that chris doe it is me i'm here and i survived <laughs> la traffic uh, weaving in and out of the the back channels if you will all right, I got a question for you. You said that I, I imagine you, I imagine you in your own map, in your Batmobile, just like <laughs> <laughs> the, the jet just wasn't working, so I couldn't convert to the oh, the, the Batmobile flying. Anyways, yeah. the question I have for you is this: is you said like, why don't we just unplug from the echo chamber? Why don't we just do that? Mm -hmm. I got I had a question. Why do we care so much about what other people think? One way is one way is to get out of the echo chamber, but one one other way is to stay in the echo chamber and don't give. A fudge. You can, say it. you can say it. I said it. Um, I think. I think it's the nature of our work, man. I think it's the nature of our work. As a service industry, you live and die by what somebody else thinks of you. I, is that I don't good? Agree. Is that healthy? I, no, not at all. I don't Let's agree with that. I don't agree with it at yeah. all. But I do think that most of the time, I, I'll say, I think in our industry, we're still in the first wave of people learning how to do this, right? Like mm -hmm. Chris, you're one of the leading edge. You're still figuring out how to do it, right? Like yep. no one's, no one has the example of the playbook. Like, like there isn't a, um, there isn't even a Saul Bass of our industry to say, oh, that's how a guy went through an industry and set up a career and created a, a legacy like we don't have that yet people are still figuring out how to age gracefully you know how to support a family into older age like we're making it up as we go i i think there's just a lot of really bad habits psychologically that thankfully now there are forums and people starting to talk about it but i remember when i went to imaginary forces the the first week i was there i asked somebody about rates and i had three old time you know freelancers tell me loose lips sink ships we don't talk about rates shut the f up right don't ask question mm -hmm. no that's seven years ago that's insane that's like in any other industry that's like the 50s union busting you know bs um so i, I think it's gonna take time i think we need to see more examples of people doing their own thing and not necessarily just going and starting their own company to just do more service work but find a way to you know there are people in our industry who are who are technicians and i'm not going to say the b word because i don't want to bring it back up there are people who press buttons and do a great job <laughs> <of each laughs> <laughs> you won't say it. You just pulled the Trump. You just pulled the Trump right now. I will not mention that woman's name. Right. You got it. What do you want to say? You know, there, are people, there are people who make things, yeah, yeah. And, but there are the people who see great art and it bothers them that they can't make that art. Those people are artists, whether or not yeah. they consider themselves artists, right? Like that's what that thing is when you say I've got imposter syndrome. Oh, yeah. I'm paralyzed by looking at my Instagram feed. That's you saying, man, I wish I could be an artist or I could make something like that. You're the kind of person who maybe doesn't necessarily need to spend an entire life in a service industry you have to find a way to create a following create create something inside of you that says something more than just what you know google needs you to do today for a job um it's fine that there's both of those paths but i feel like we haven't really laid down the gold the, the yellow brick road for what it is for someone who wants to do that mm -hmm. there's a clear path for someone who wants to just be making money right like you go to school you get a job you get enough of a name you go freelance maybe you start your own company or you become a creative director somewhere else at an agency that's it that well, doesn't happen the past let's do this let's write some wrongs right now let's write some wrongs you said seven years ago you're freelancing these old-timey crusty dudes are like don't talk about money we don't talk about money and mm -hmm. i think there's some insecurity there's uh, uh, some scarcity mindset going on well, well, let's here. do a public service announcement right now what kind of question did you ask them and let's answer it right now live on air let's do that mm -hmm. so at least we I can said, have this conversation out in the open Sure. I was, um, I'll tell you right now, uh, seven years ago, I was making $400 a day mm -hmm. at Imaginary Forces. And I saw other people who weren't staying late, who weren't working hard, who didn't have the technical knowledge that I had, didn't have the increasingly closer relationships to creative directors and building trust. Mm -hmm. And I asked them next to me, who I knew had been working as long. I was like, man, I'm like, what should I be charging? I, I have no idea because I came from Chicago. I don't know what the cost of living differences are. I don't know right. where I am. I a designer. I didn't go to Art Center. I went to a crappy school that doesn't even exist anymore what should i price myself i have no i don't even know who to ask and a guy next to me heard that a guy in the industry 15 years and literally to the room full of 15 artists in grant lau's room in imaginary forces <laughs> said, and said out loud don't talk about rates right. loose lips ships yep. shut the f up 
and don't ask that question again. Man. Okay. Wow. And, then, and, and, then, and, then, and then two days later, yeah. <laughs> two days later, someone in the company came to me and was like, hey, um, you really need to raise your rate by at least $100 a day because they're taking advantage of you. And oh. thankfully, someone pulled me aside. But in the room, the peer pressure was, we don't talk about that stuff. That's, that's bad business. That, that's, if, we get, if we all get too expensive, then they won't be able to pay for us. And we'll mm. all lose our jobs. Right. Let's, like, say, let's say you were sitting next to you and you mm -hmm. asked yourself that question. And the 15 year old veteran scoots over and tells you a different answer. How should have that, how, what should have the response should have been? The response in the room should have been, no, what, you, exactly what happened. It should have been out loud though. It should have been, it's why I do office hours right now, right? Like yeah. at lunch every day, I talk to two to three people for free. They can ask me any questions. They can look at their dumb reels. And it's directly, directly built as a reaction to that, that moment where I was like, information should not be locked away. We're not programmers. We're not union workers. We don't have a scale that says you have to work a certain amount of days or a certain amount of years for hours to have seniority. You get what you're worth. And if you know what you're worth, because other people help you realize that, then th it lifts all boats. It helps everyone. Mm, okay. Matt and Greg, you guys work with a lot of freelancers. Mm -hmm. If you were in that room, what would you have advised them? I have my answer. I want to hear yours. One of you guys? I feel like this is a trap. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, don't, don't fall for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would I would tell them from my perspective and, and what other people charge in the industry. So for me, when I was first starting out, I charged $300 a day, yep. quickly moved up to $500 a day. And then when I stopped freelancing, I, I capped out about $600 a day. Mm -hmm. um, I've paid people more than that, and I've pe paid people less than that. But that should give you a range of where somebody might be coming out if they're just a junior designer to mid-range to uh, high-end. So I could only give you what... Um, other people are charging because people have been very open with me on, on how they charge. So right. I, I would just re reciprocate and, and share that knowledge. And I've done a whole episode on this mm -hmm. all about junior, mid, and, and high-end rates. Um, but that's how I would address that person. Okay. I'd like to address it. I've been taking some acting lessons, so let's see if I can pretend if I were sitting next to Ryan in that room, if Aaron would just cut to my face, it would be lovely today. There we go. All right, here's what I would do. I'll be like, do, you want me, do you want me to ask? Do you want me to ask? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Set the scene. Set yeah. the scene. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sitting next to you. Okay. Chris, I feel like I'm busting my ass, Chris, and I'm new here. I know I'm doing really well. My work's valuable because they keep on asking me back. I've been here yeah. for six months. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. Am I am I not making enough? Like like I'm not asking you to tell me how much you make, but is four hundred dollars like way low or am I where I should be? Oh. Right. We, let's have this conversation a little to the side. I'll tell you why. Because when people hear this kind of stuff, they get really uncomfortable and they start spreading stories about you being a troublemaker. You just trying to be too uppity. But let me just lay down the truth for you here. You can get whatever amount of money that you mm -hmm. can successfully negotiate and it can range from $200 to $1,200, maybe even more. And really what you want to do is you want to sit here and you want to observe what people are doing and kind of gauge how you fit in. Are you moving faster than the average bear here? Then you should be making a better than average rate here. And I think given your skills at what I've seen you thus far, how you're able to connect with other art directors, how committed you are to the work and how fast you are, I think you are grossly undercharging. But you didn't hear this from me. <laughs> and and that's where i know chris is acting because I, chris is an agitator chris chris likes making people feel uncomfortable in a good way <laughs> not that, when i was a freelancer though as a freelancer like, you're like i don't want to get blacklisted right, right right but that's an agent of change though yeah. i didn't get blacklisted i asked a question right, and then right. days later but but i think that that culture of fear and that culture of scarcity is is baloney and i'm i'm in chicago right now right yep two jobs it's six million dollars worth of work i cannot find a freelancer to work on either my jobs in the midwest mm. at all okay right? all right. right what's your email address because you're gonna get flooded <laughs> yeah. with people who want to go work for dk in chicago making good money how do they but get I mean, in I, contact with you oh they can they can just go to my calendar app go to calendly.com slash and we can talk about anything you want to talk beautiful about. so uh, calendly.com slash otternod yeah make an appointment Wow. An appointment. I'm available. Um, but yeah, but I mean, like, like I work with right now, I have a project that has eight remote freelancers and literally they're all around the world. Japan, Australia, a guy in London, two people in Detroit, somebody up in Milwaukee and mm. two people in LA. Not a single person in Chicago, right? Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's no shortage, man. There's no shortage. And I know people get mad when I say like, if you want to level up fast, go to LA, but it's the truth. You can go from being very base level 
basic animator, you know, mm -hmm. working in After Effects and just learning Cinema 4D. And if you can get into a shop and be reliable, show your worth, be a, a good communicator, be a positive influence in the room, um, you can level up in a year so much faster than if you sat in your, your office or your home for five years. Yeah. It, it, it's amazing. Fantastic. You know, when you're rattling off the different cities, it is all, almost sounds like a Pitbull song coming on there. <laughs> Ibiza, Tokyo, London, boom. All right, Greg, what's next on the agenda? What are we going to talk about now? I'm, I'm just going through your deck, Chris. So <laughs> let's, let's see. Um, burnout. Are we all being overworked and undervalued? I feel like there's a, there's a nice segue there. So, mm -hmm. right, we talked about what life was like seven years ago in the industry. How mm -hmm. about now? How, how's the vibe out there now in, in terms of um, people being undervalued and the, the dialogue and uh, are, I mean, I remember working until 5 a.m. consecutive nights on jobs and mm -hmm. being like, okay, cool. Well, I guess I'll just like sleep in this one day and then get back to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that I happen think, um, anymore? What, what's going on out yeah, there? I think it happens a lot, but I, I, here's the differences. I think some of the stuff we were just talking about now, people are more aware about rates. People are more aware about how to book themselves. They know about kill fees and they know about first holds and they know how to run contracts, you know, thanks to what you guys are doing, what Motion Hatch is doing, Joey's book. Um, I think what we're, we're starting to see now is we're switching over from actively physically being burned out <clears throat> to a more insidious psychological burnout. I think that that's what's really starting to hit the industry hard is that people know how to manage jobs. They, they're getting better at kind of predicting things. That's not to say that you don't have your you know, all-nighters or your crazy pushes to the end. But what I see and what I get from the whatever 190 people I talk to a year is that there's a deeper set psychological burnout that is not easy to reset from. It's something that's creating a lot of caustic friction. It's creating a lot of envy, a lot of jealousy, um, a lot of just disdain for the industry at large. Mm. Um, and that's not something that, you know, you can take the weekend off and sleep through and get back and reset yourself. Um, the, the psychological exhaustion and burnout, I think, is much worse and much more difficult to even talk about, let alone kind of find solutions for them. What are some of the symptoms of the psychological burnout that you're talking about? This is kind of a new phrasing or nuanced thing that I've not heard before. So can you expand on this? Sure, I can give you a really specific example, right? Mm -hmm. So um, on these on these office hours, you know, anybody can kind of sign up for it. So I don't know what people's concerns are. Normally, it's a demo reel or asking about you know raising my rate or I'm going to move to a new city. How should I handle it? Um, but occasionally, I'd say probably five to ten percent of the people that reach out to me reach out out of abject anger. They reach out to me. I get on a Zoom. I talk to them like this. I'm like, so how's it going? How can I help you? And they're like, f you. What? Yeah, no, no, literally, they're Did like f you, f you? F F me, yeah. Like, like, <laughs> oh my God, are you serious? Oh, 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 I'm, I'm absolutely serious. Face they're, to they're, face, they're gonna do this with you? Yes, yes. Yeah. So there's, Holy there's, cow. A, there's a deep seated underlying, and it's something I think we really have to, to talk about. Yeah. And stress, but there's a latent anger from the 35 and up, I'll okay. say male, okay. most of the time Caucasian, okay. white guys yeah, that right. are super upset, that are super upset at the industry passing them by, right? And it's, they will, mm. they will, they will, they oh. will, they will verbalize it. They will verbalize it as mm -hmm. you're giving away tutorials, the future and Grayscale Grill and Andrew Kramer are, are, are making tools that are free. I spent all this money on things like Sapphire and all these part wow. of this part. And, and uh, they're taking my jobs. They're they taking my jobs. They're working for less money. They'll work longer hours. And the first thing I do, the first thing I do every time, because I don't want to look at anybody's you know, negative emotion and just throw it back at them. The first thing I say is, let's go look at your demo reel. And 90% of the time, they're like, no, no, that's not the problem. I don't want to talk about it. But then when I <laughs> down and look at the demo reel, we realize like what you're really saying is you got into the industry when you could be a technician. You could get an, a competitive advantage because you had a little bit of money to buy a computer and you trained yourself and you know how to make the software hum, right? Mm -hmm. The industry has now gotten to a maturity level where you have to, at default, be an artist and a technician to survive. And what's happening is there's now even more of a, I don't know the right way to say it. There's more of an impetus to have art driven work rather than technology driven work in these people's geographic areas. And they're getting outpaced immediately by people who have design fundamentals that they never invested in. And inevitably, that's what I see a lot of times is that there's just this latent anger that is deeply psychological that takes a lot of work to try to get someone to, for one, admit that they're like, you know what, you're right. I really need to make my demo 
real better. And I mm. probably need to go back and kind of learn some color design and some layout and understand value texture or value contrast and any of the other things we talk about. Because when you look at it, what inevitably always happens is, and you've seen these all a million times, they're demo reels that are type slams. The effects look amazing. They've got clouds. They've got all this other stuff happening, but the type isn't current correctly. The choices of the types are awful. The color palettes make no sense at all. Mm. Really easy kind of say like, hey man, like you can course correct this, but it's gonna take hard work. And it's like when I used to work um, in 2D animation, when the transition happened from hand-drawn animation to flash, a good portion of the industry just walked away at 35 to 40 years old because they would not animate on a computer. They would not embrace the next step. And it's even harder for someone who's had a lot of success to say, you know what, you're not as good of an artist as you thought you were. Um, that, that's part of it. I think the other part of it is that there's a lot of people trying to do this Freelance is the one true way of living as an artist, and they're having a really difficult time with it, and they don't have the support system around them. That they mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. We have a lot to talk about just on what you just <laughs> said right there. So let's uh, buckle up, people, because another controversy is about to be born on this show, I believe. So awesome. you're tapping into something, this anger. And you say it's latent. I just think it's bubbling over. It's caustic. It's angry. It's what's all that's wrong with the Internet. People are just, just so angry about things, okay? So at first I thought you were going to say something else, but you said they're angry because we're giving out information and we're educating a younger public and they're angry at that. So they're angry at Kramer. They're angry at Grayscale Gorilla, Joey Corman, yourself, me. Is that why they're angry? No, no, it's definitely not. Okay. It, 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 it's, it's what we said at the beginning. It, it's, you know where you stand with your competition, right? You know where you stand with yeah. your club. You know where you stand with your aspirations from when you started, right? It's very easy to gloss that over when the checks are coming in and the work shows up. But when the work stops showing up, when it, when it gets harder to find you know the the next freelance opportunity or the studios aren't calling you anymore or you don't have those direct to client relationships where do you go what what, what do you blame you don't blame yourself because that's the hardest thing to fix you blame every other problem uh, and, i see and I, I i mean i think i think it's good that this anger exists out in the world and we can see it and we can hear it because we have to talk about it we have yeah. to address it. if we didn't it's the same thing i don't want to get into politics but i do think 25 years from now we will look back and this is like, wow, this is when we actually started looking at each other as human beings, if it goes in any positive direction, instead of just finger pointing and stereotyping. And it's the very difficult thing for both sides or any side to say like, wow, there's a human being behind that anger. There's a human being behind that trollish behavior. At some point, like we do have to accept that and listen and not just hear each other. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So there, there's a lot that's going on in their life that they don't like. It's trending in a negative way that there's younger people coming into the industry taking their jobs their rates are getting lower they're getting booked less and so they want to direct the anger somewhere if i'm hearing you correctly and where they want to direct it is people like you and me because we're visible we're easy targets right they're just mm -hmm. going to find a reason to be angry but i gotta say something i'm angry i'm really angry because you know what in the early 2000s before the dot-com crash happened we were making ten thousand dollars to do a 2d animated title just a simple <laughs> yeah. super on a black background per title so when I did 13 of them, I made $130,000. Eventually mm -hmm. that went away. And you know why that went away? Because more and more people were entering the market, more companies were sprouting up, and agencies had a choice. But I didn't mm -hmm. sit there and say, oh, there's freaking kids starting up these firms. What are you gonna do? I mean, that is, that's not even productive. That's not even real. Like, things change. Things change all the time. So you have a choice, yeah. evolution is an inherent advantage but if you choose not to change then you choose to get the results that you're getting period yeah. period well, everything I mean, has changed what about the coach builders who are angry at ford for making cars affordable what about yeah. those people <laughs> we, I, mean, we, we, I mean come on guys it's super simple man like I, I like today does not determine tomorrow right like like what happens today does, is not an indication of what's going to happen tomorrow, right? That's a false pretext, like that, that does not work. But what you can accept is that if you get into an industry that's made and built on artistic principles, that you have to maintain the lifestyle and the mentality and the spirit of a capital A artist, right? As an artist, your oath, that if we had one like a doctor's oath, the first thing that would say is that your job for the rest of your life is to always be learning. And side note, probably also to teach others because that's the best way to learn. Yeah. If you don't mm -hmm. accept that and you don't believe that, like that, then you're you're screwed yep. like like time will pass you by it will be like it's the same thing for music it's the same thing for film it's the same thing for animation if you don't accept that and embrace it and build your personality and your career and your life around it 
time, it will pass you by mm. and you can be angry about it or you can just find another thing to do. But that's one true thing that's inevitable no matter what. Yeah. I think there's probably some angry people right now. Let's talk to some of them. Matthew, uh, <laughs> we, we got comments. Do we want to bring our audience in? No. So most of the, we're not talking about like Houdini and cinema. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. No, most that's segment two. most of the audience is agreeing. Like, yes, I see this in the photography world. I see this in the uh, architectural world. Mm. I see this in the development world. Basically, this is happening everywhere. So that's not just isolated to the motion design industry. It's happening mm. everywhere, right? Because information, internet, everything is Fashion, faster. Everything. It's faster. Mm. It's cheaper it's more accessible and that's just the trend you can't you can't really fight that so you either embrace it or you continue whining and complaining about it Woo! i will i will say though if, if i can add to that yeah um i do think that there is something uniquely different about the motion design industry that i don't see in the gaming industry i don't see in the film industry i see bits and pieces in the animation industry the willingness by everybody from a bottom level to the highest level to, to a talk about this but b share and give so much is something that I think is, I don't know why it exists this way, I don't know where it came from, but even back in the MoGraph.net days, the pre-Andrew Kramer Grayscale <laughs> world, there were people who went out of their way, the Brian Moffitts of the world. Yeah, that, oh yeah, Brian Moffitt. There's people that, there's a, there's a spirit of, I think because of what we do is at its core, not even storytelling, it's problem solving, mm -hmm. that there's just an inquisitive, curious nature in most of the people who get here, that no matter what, if you're Arne Rabinowitz, if, uh oh, uh, want to share and make the daily lives of all of the people in our industry better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very different. I, I, you see in the photography industry that there's some of it, but it is a dog eat dog world, right? The film and animation mm -hmm. world, those are hyper competitive. Music mm -hmm. is, forget about it. People fight each other all the time to, to keep information away, to not share things, to take techniques and, and you know, patent them and lock them up and not you know, share that information. I, I think there's something about motion design that is really, really different. All right, I want to read some comments here. I, they're not necessary questions, but I want to give you some of the feedback that I'm reading here. So some great stuff coming in. John Zilla is saying, this is must-see YouTube. <laughs> All right, must-see YouTube, you guys. Grant Inouye is saying, Ryan takes on the industry. Ryan's take on the industry is so good. David Coe, David Coe, a familiar face and a chatter on our show, saying, speaking truth, 110%. 110%. I also want to say hi to Heather Crank, who's a fan of yours as well. So let's keep going. Awesome. So what do we do? That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got to do? do something? We got to do, do something? It's going to blow my mind. What do we do about burnout? It's one thing to talk about it, right? Yeah. It's one thing to talk about. Like, what do we do about burnout? Like, like physical burnout, creative burnout there's a lot of techniques there's a lot of books you can read about that, right? Steve Jobs said the best thing you can ever do is take a walk. Separate, de detach, take a walk with someone else, talk about something that's totally different answers will come from the silence the answers will come from the space you create in the world so the answer isn't just grinding harder isn't smashing the square peg into a hole 20 times faster it's not staying up until four in the morning you will almost always if you have an all-nighter if you go to bed at 10 and wake up at three or four o'clock what you do in the next two hours will almost always be better than what you spent those six hours trying to bash out it's almost a rule yeah. um so I, I think physical burnout there's a lot of tools that we can you know yep. you guys already do it there's places here the psychological burnout though the the deep weight of trying to carry your family's burden or your company's burden or your aspirations and not being able to succeed that's a totally different thing all bets are off with that right like there almost needs to be like a dr phil of motion design <laughs> or, a, or a like therapist table and i, I think the only way I, yeah yeah the only way i can get through it the only way i can get through it is to just by talking talking to other people that's mm. why i do the open office hours seeing other people at the same level higher or below you if you see someone higher, it makes you feel like, oh, I can get through this. If you see someone at the same level going through it, you're like, I can learn something from you. And if you see someone below, you're like, I can help them. So having those kind of conversations all the time with people above, below, and at your same level, I think it's it's absolutely imperative to find a way to create community and have dialogues, whether it's Slack, Twitter, calling on the phone, doing a hangout, watching more tutorials, watching podcasts, like starting the communication and not walling yourself off, I think is the first step. But I feel like there's got to be a lot more out there that I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could speak about the physical burnout. I think one of the things that I think has changed, hopefully as any industry matures, is you get into more standard ways of working so that those 4 a.m. mornings aren't 
normal and aren't expected of young people to do as a rite of passage. I just don't believe in that at all. Manage your projects well. Yeah. And I'm guilty of this. I was guilty of doing it, like being in it. Like, wow, this is so exciting to work on these yeah. projects and also saying, hey, man, we need to stay here and make this thing perfect. So there's this mm -hmm. culture of like, oh, let's just squeeze every little pixel out of this thing. And oh, that little pixel is a little off. Let's just work on that. And yeah. at the end of the day, nobody even freaking cares. So let's manage right. the projects better. Let's manage our people our culture so that there's long-term longevity and sustainability for all. We don't want to kill people in making their art. And unfortunately, so many creative sign up for this as volunteers because we think, oh, this is the way it must be. You got to pay your dues and you got to do this. And Chris Doe and all those guys, they, they, they're stupid. You have to work really, really hard. We can work mm -hmm. smart and we can manage to have a life and do creative work and not yeah. to be burnt out, right? So we, yeah. can, we can tackle that. Yeah. yeah, I think I think there's some some solutions to that too, right? Yeah, that are yeah. probably bigger bigger hot topic button pushing issues, but I do think they kind of go to that. I, I think um, uh, pixel fucking is torture, not sport. Yep. Right. So that's that's number one, and I think that that's a direct rela relation to the jocularity of the industry's environment because it's ninety percent men, and I think that white men. So there's just this aspect of everything is 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 conf confrontation, everything is friction. Only things get better from suffering whatever you want to call it, right? I think as we get more women, we get more minorities, we get people of all different ages and all different influences in the motion design industry, that um, that kind of jocularity that you also see in the video game industry, um, that you're only good if you work you know, 14 hours in a row, a project's only good if you feel like you're about to die once you finish it. The phrase death march needs to be excised from all creative industries. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing there's nothing to be proud of that. I think if it's not just 90% dudes all the time kind of pushing that mentality, that mm -hmm. is a safety mechanism to say nobody else can even do this except for me and I have to kill myself every time I even do a deliverable. Um, that's that's not right. There's something wrong about that. There's, there's you're not handling your job right. Um, but I do think I do think that there's that that's still just physical, right? Like that's still just right. right it's physical. Mm -hmm. um, I I think I, I've seen. Um, Haley from Motion Hatch doing this. I started one myself. I'm seeing more and more people doing um, creative masterminds mm -hmm. where you get together with six to eight people. You have 12 weeks to basically say, where am I at right now? And where do I want to be in six months? And those six people together kind of keep them, themselves accountable and they, they have realistic goals, but they, I'm do, I've been doing it for about eight weeks and 90% of the time we're just talking about our mindset, how to approach the week that's coming up. It's almost like having a producer slash therapist for a group of people, but it's just the group of people doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, you know, in a, in a company that turns into like, how do you management? Do you, do you, at the beginning of every week, do you do a 15 minute stand up where the managers don't talk, all the creatives or all the workers talk and the managers just have to listen and they don't have to, they can't respond. They just have to take what's going on and try to react to it. And then by the end of the week, there's kind of solutions for that. Um, I don't know. I think there's a lot of psychological kind of, uh, workshops and, and techniques that we have to kind of start to develop as much as we develop, you know, GPU rendering and if we're going to use Houdini, <laughs> you know, like how we're going to edit it. Right. I, I wanted to jump in here because I'm glad you brought up the, the mastermind group and just seeing your peers do it. And I think this goes all the way to the beginning about people sharing. And I, I think one way to help address the potential hurdles that people have in their head is because the story you were giving earlier about the older guys in the industry, it's like it's an us and them. It's because the them is unrelatable. If they had more examples out there, stories being told of people who are their age, their demographic, where they're coming from, who are making these transitions and are doing other things or you know, have found a better way. That's why we brought somebody like Robert uh, Renitsky on the show. Mm -hmm. It's like then they could relate to somebody like that. It's like, oh, now I can identify with somebody else. And that's why we like to do this often on our show to try and bring uh, varied guests from different places, different spaces, because we know that even though if Chris Doe keeps saying the same thing over and over and over, yeah. there's going to be a large uh, group of people who are not going to resonate with his message because they can't re re relate to Chris. But if yeah. Greg says the same thing, if I say the same thing, if somebody else says the same thing in their way, somebody else, there's a whole audience for that that's going to relate to that and is going to mm -hmm. hear it in a better way. And I think that's where um, you know having the peer groups is important because your they're your peers. You know you could relate to each other the same challenges, and also seeing people uh, in a public forum like this, where you can hear other stories and you can see people who have made transition or have dealt with uh, adversities or challenges in their life or in their career. So I, I think mm -hmm. these are ways that we can help um, get over that hump and some of these mental hurdles. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think if you can ever see someone who's 10 years your senior and they're talking about the same problem that you talk to somebody who's three years into the industry mm -hmm. and you can connect those two people, you can say like, oh man, like you own a shop and the same problems that you're having as a shop owner of 10 years is the same thing somebody who is years into the industry is feeling. There's at least a little bit more sense of like, well, we're, we are kind of all in the same boat. We're all in it together. It's not me versus you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think, I think that's awesome. I want to jump in on this. I want to jump in on this. The, yep. One of the things that I'm noticing, and forgive me, internets, for making broad statements we're just saying about our own experiences in our life. Of course, we cannot cover every nuance and individual experience out there. But here's what I think is the problem. We have a culture of scarcity and protectionism where we look at like a tool, a technique or something we've done and we just hoard it because we think that's what makes us special. That's what makes us unique. So if we share this, we're giving it away. We're giving it all away and some cookie cutter clone version of me is going to go out there and do it for half my price. Mm -hmm. And there's this mentality. That's why there's a divide between people who just graduated from school and people that are out from five, 10 and 20 years. They just feel like, hey, I figured it out on my own, use the internet and figure it out. And we talk to a lot of artists that share this mentality and I can't change it. And we're not even talking about the motion industry. This is just artists in general. Mm -hmm. They're just very, they, they have this protectionist mentality and it's, it's weird. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing it reflected in politics right now too, right? Yeah. All these tariffs and everything that's going on. It's like, let's just hold on to what we have. Now, don't we realize we grow richer and we can be for more than just making a dollar today that it's a greater sign of confidence to share what it is that you know so openly and not even expect anything in return. Why do mm -hmm. we have to say to another person that's coming up behind us, you figured out you do it the hard way and I'm not going to save you one bit of effort either in technique or mental or mindset or anything or philosophy. Why would I do that? And that's right. the problem. We have to change that. Yeah. There, I, yep. I, I, you nailed it, Chris. I, I think the concept of trade secrets is just oh. what? Who cares? Yeah. Who cares? There are about no that? such things yeah. as trade secrets. <laughs> ah! uh, it doesn't like, matter. Like I can't reverse engineer that in three minutes, and you don't want to tell people how to do it. Are you kidding me? If no. I'm if I'm being totally honest Be. about like <laughs> my, my my technical abilities, I would say ninety nine percent of the stuff I learned from Googling or asking someone else. <laughs> they taught me. I didn't figure that out. I am not that smart. And if I was so smart as to discover some amazing thing that I'm like. Oh my God, no one's talking about no one. Of course I would share it. Cause I'd be like, isn't this cool? That's awesome. Right. I'm, I'm not, but I mean that that's, that's, that's it. Everything I learned came from someone else. It was passed down. It was taught. It was searched for on Google search for on YouTube. That's it. I want to tell this story. Say what you want about Guy Fieri on diners, drive-ins and drive throughs <laughs> right? This, this is what Guy Fieri does. He goes to these little hole in the wall, mom and pop operations. Some of them are decent probably. And he goes in the back and the chef is cooking the food or the cook, you know, and he's making stuff. And he's like, yeah, this is how we make our secret chili sauce. And it's like two parts of this, two parts of that. And one part of something I can't tell you. Guy goes like this, dips it in, come in, paprika, gotcha. It's like, yeah. are you stupid? Are you stupid? Yeah. Are you crazy that a guy who knows what he's doing can't come in and reverse engineer your whole formula? And yeah. in the book Rework, Jason Fried tells people to, to write your recipe and share it, write your cookbook. And yeah. this idea of hoarding your information is actually just really hurting you. If you think mm -hmm. about some of the celebrity chefs, the best known chefs in the world, I'm not saying the best chefs in terms of their cooking quality, but the best known, Bobby Flay, Anthony O'Brien, Bourdain, all these people, what they do is they release cookbooks. They literally tell you very scientifically, here's how you create this thing. And the better they do, of a job of telling you how to do what they do, the more famous they get, the more money they make, and the more valuable they become. Contrast yeah. that with the mom and pop shop owner, the chef in the bag is like, oh, mama, secret recipe. I'm never going to tell anybody this. Are you kidding me? This is just killing me right now, you guys. You guys have to get over this. I'm sorry for coming in with so much energy and heat on this. This is how I feel. <laughs> you guys can't see it, but there's a massive vein about to just pop on Chris's neck. <laughs> I was That's working crazy. out this morning, you guys. That's why he wears the hat. That's why he wears the hat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to see that vibrate on my head. No, I'll dude, I, I totally believe you, man. I think, I think the the... Literally in the creative world, in the creative industry, the only magic, there's no magic ingredients, there's no magic tools, there's no magic techniques. The only magic that means anything to a client, to your success, is literally you. Yes. Like it's, yep. That is literally 100% it is you. Because if you look at Guy Fieri, if you look at Anthony Bourdain, if you look at musicians, everybody can play the same chords, right? Everybody has the same instruments. Nobody yeah, has yeah. Any 
different new. And if it is different new, guess what happens? Everybody copies it, and then you have everybody's work looking like Patrick Clare for three years. The only magic is do you do something and do you explain it and do you have a voice and a vision? And is there a ride I can, as a client, join you for a little bit by tapping into you, getting off a, a little bit of your heat or getting a little bit of your, your shine? That's the stuff that matters. That's why I scream so much about voice and vision. Like, what what is unique about you? What are the thousand things you read and saw and experienced and lived at and searched on Google? Yeah. And aspirations mixed with that. Like, there's a reason why I watch every time Greg Gunn sits down and, and shows us how he draws. Right. Uh-huh. Instagram, that is an instant classic. Like the last video you just did, like immediately it's like, hey, where, why aren't there 15 more of those on online, right? There's a reason why, the only magic, I still think the only magic that's left that impresses clients is especially in a world of technology and GPU renders is when someone can put a pencil to paper and make something out of nothing. If you do that in front of a client, you have the capability to do that, or you can talk to someone even better with no artistic effort and put an image in their head that they can never see before, that's magic. That's it. It always has been. It always will be. Everything else is just a race to the bottom. Yes. So here's a little bite-sized version of that. You can't spell unique without you. It's you. It's always yeah. been you. All right. Thanks, guys. No support on that one. <laughs> <laughs> my, team, my team's leaving me hanging there like, Chris, don't quit your day job. Don't worry about the comedy thing. Go back I to the acting, the acting uh, <laughs> classes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're not ready for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, guys. Everybody's like, a critic. Everybody's a, a critic. Is that a page in your book? That's yeah, a page in your book. Right? It's got to be. It's got to <laughs> be. <laughs> No, you're, you're totally right. And I think if you, if you look at music, you know, there's only so many chords you can play and yeah. the finite number of instruments even. And they're, they're all the, you can, there's this really great video, I forget the name of the band, but they play the cover songs, which is the, the same exact chord progression of like four or five chords. And it's from music from the last 30 years, huge, massive songs are all the same chords, <laughs> same exact progression, different lyrics, different person. And, mm-hmm. and that's, that's what makes the difference. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, I totally agree. What else is on that list, Chris? Yes, what let's let's knock list? out what's the next thing on the list. Let's, let's okay. firebomb one more time. What do we got? Trends. Yeah, trends. What are let's your point trend. of view? Let's talk about trends. Yeah, should you be a trend maker, trend follower, trend setter, trend, setter, trend ignorer? What do you think? Um, the cheap eats and trend chasing, yeah. probably, right? Like you get the likes and the, and the follows and maybe a little bit of notoriety, but I, I, at least with what everybody's chasing now, I don't see anybody hiring people to do the work that you see everybody kind of chasing. I say it all the time. Like do it do the trend chasing as a sketchbook, do the trend trend chasing as a way to develop your voice or learn a new skill. That's awesome. But don't expect work to come out of it. It comes out like that plus whatever you're interested in. Um, I don't know. I feel like there, there's some basic trends that keep on happening right now. Like everybody, if you're doing 2D animation, draws the same character designs. Mm-hmm. Like there's <laughs> a thousand people doing 2D animation. That's yes. all. It's hot little right now. Heads. It's yeah. a hotness. Little, yeah. Little heads, long legs and black triangle drop shadows. Like I'm, I'm, I'm ready for that to be done you know like there's, <laughs> if, you want, if you wanted to rip something off there's like a thousand other character designers from the last 25 years that have done 2d animation um i don't know i i, I feel like in trends that i really do enjoy um there are more new studios from places i haven't seen animation coming out of that i'm extremely excited by there was um a couple days ago i don't know how you pronounce it but it's a uh, iqoo um there's a, a new product tech product and uh agency out of Shanghai called, I can't remember the name of it, the agency out of Shanghai, but they did this awesome trailer for um, title reveals. And it has some of the best animation I've ever seen in my life, but every piece, it's about three seconds across as a trailer of the 10 people they commission. Um, And it's totally different kinds of animation um, all put together. But there's also a really great piece um, called Mate that came out of uh, South America from a company called Buddha. And it's almost the same idea where there's an opening uh, segment, 10 to 15 seconds, all CG, um, very cartoony shapes, but very realistic shaping. Um, so it looks really different. And then the character really takes the, the cup of tea and then hands it off to the screen. And then it continues to do that. And it's a different animator or a different artist from South America from a different country. Mm-hmm. Um, some big names and some smaller names, but the color palette's there. It's automatic. It's like, wow, there's actually a, a social identity that you can apply to a geographical location in work that we just have not seen, you know, a- across everything. So for me, you know, like I grew up loving Japanese animation and European and French graphic novels. There were immediately was something that felt different than what we had in America. I would love to see that start to trend. It feels like it's becoming something where people from different places and different backgrounds um, are getting shots at very large opportunities. And I think then that gets into the echo chamber and it's not as much of an echo. It's three or four strains of something different that people can riff off of. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. I think trends are great. I I like trends. I don't I don't care about them at all. But I'm like, oh, that's cool, interesting. <laughs> and I think the best part is, 
as soon as you get familiar with it, it changes. Yeah. And then you're onto something new. And I'm, I, I like something new all the time. I, I think that's a really interesting thing to kind of pursue creatively. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think trends are great. Should you spend your time following them and trying to um, design your work around them? Probably not a good idea. I, mm -hmm. I choose to ig ignore that. And like, sometimes what I do is like, yeah, this is probably part of a trend, but then maybe it's not. And also, yeah. who cares? Who cares? I think trends I, are great for what they are, though. So what? I, I think I'm more fascinated by them scientifically to figure out how they became a trend. Mm. Like I like trying to go. I, I, I saw this talk at a, at a hotel around here recently, and this guy's gone on since done it at like South by Southwest. But he did a, um, a, a scientific analysis. It was called Who Let Who Let the Dogs Out Out. And it, <laughs> I it, love it, that. That's it funny. Was trying to find the, the, the history of how the song came to be. And he's taking it, he was like, he was unemployed for a few months. And he's like, where did this song come from? And he started trying to track back like all the places where that beat and that, that kind of like dog barking thing could have come from. And he's literally found like three pathways of people who never met each other, who could not have ever known each other, but pre-internet could not have shared anything, all came up with essentially the same beat and the idea of mm -hmm. dogs barking to the beat at the same time. And they all are essentially fighting with each other over who came up with it and i was at one early like discussion of this in chicago and a guy from like the chicago house uh scene from back in the day was like i wrote who let the dog it up it's just like i did it and then this guy played something that was from three years earlier that was somebody in like carnival who basically did the exact same song and the guy's like shit i guess i didn't write who let the dogs out like there's something fascinating <laughs> about like how does a trend become a trend because shit's just in the air right like they're just we're all looking and reading and seeing the same stuff essentially the, you know if it was a simulation you would have three of the same thing at some point like I, that's to me is the fascinating thing about trends like not like complaining about like where it's at or like right. what's the but how did it happen like how mm. did it catch fire where did it come from you're like a cultural anthropologist in that way it's like let's retrace the steps and kind of see how jazz was created in yeah. these certain yeah. political social conditions in this environment this is how it was born but yeah most people when they talk about trends i think they're talking about what greg was saying and there's yeah. this unhealthy obsession with am i on trend am i too trendy should i or shouldn't i follow the trends mm -hmm. and i think that's you're asking the wrong question to begin with just try to do good work that feels true to you and authentic mm -hmm. and yeah. that's uh, appropriate for the assignment that you're given now you yeah. may be in love with patrick claire and doing these double exposures but he didn't invent that either that's not him. That comes from the world of photography many decades before. But you sit there and say, I love this thing. I want to try this thing. And every single project comes in the door. You say, double exposure must be the answer. Then you're probably doing it the wrong way. Right. You're doing it the wrong way. Well, and you know, the, the thing I keep on telling people all the time is like, there's a reason why double exposure became a, a thing. Because the way what he did with True Detective, it it's the same thing with title sequence all the time, right? You can make a title sequence that's just about technique and it's cool and then people forget about it. But when you... You, you find a way to pair a technique and an artistic style with a message about the, sh the show. Like that show is about mystery, right? That show is about yep. simplicity. That show is about uncovering something that you wouldn't expect from something that you assume is truth. And when you see double exposures at the beginning of the show and you see that seven times in a season, all of a sudden, maybe consciously, maybe subconsciously, it starts wearing on you that, oh, this is actually what the show is about. The show has been trying to tell me to dig under the surface yes. because what I see and what I'm actually, like my brain is taking note of are two separate things. Right. And that's what the characters are going through. A title mm -hmm. sequence puts you in the head or the emotion of the, the lead character. That's a great title sequence. It's not how the hell do they do double exposures? I got to do that now. Right, right. So here's the thing. It's easy to copy the surface things where you're like, oh, it's this technique and a mask and I can do that. It's harder to try to understand and, and a worthwhile pursuit to understand why did they make those decisions to do it this way? What's the motivation? How does this tie into the thematic concepts that are woven throughout the story and the series? And there's a lot of deep psychological stuff. And that's what they're trying to do, like showing you literally in ways of double exposure, what's in somebody's head? What are they thinking about? and seeing symbolism and overlap uh, those kind of juxtapositions where a new third meaning is created using semiotics look that's what it's doing if you understand mm -hmm. that then you say there's many ways to express that not just double exposure so you're going to get to the root of it okay exactly. now i know this there's a highly engaged chat room here because it's on fire <laughs> i cannot keep up with them they're saying all kinds of things so guys i'm so sorry i can't read all your comments and be engaged in the conversation now i know i know it's my fault Got started a little late today, but as much as I want to keep this conversation going, we need mm -hmm. to wrap up. 
We need to wrap yeah. up. So, Ryan, I'm hoping that everybody that's watching this is getting a tremendous value and just at least just taking a moment to stop in their tracks and question some of your assumptions and your behaviors so that yeah. maybe there's a different result for you out there, whether it's about trends or uh, burnout or just the way you work in the industry and complaining and just being angry about things. Just think, is that productive? Is that helping me today? Okay, so Ryan, this is an open invitation. I think we need to do this on a more regular basis sure. because it's been straight fire. It's been <laughs> excellent. There's a whole bunch of people that are very happy right now. So awesome. thank you for coming on. Everybody, let's give Ryan Summers a round of applause. <laughs> Woo! Woo! What's that? Great talking with everybody. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Greg, set, take us off air, man. All right, this is me taking us <laughs> off air, man. <laughs> I'm excited to see this. How is he going to do Oh, my God. Thank you, Ryan Summers, for, for joining us. And thank you, everyone watching, for putting up with me this whole time. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, you can follow Ryan on the internet, plenty of places. If you guys can cut to the screen real quick. There we go. So, ryansummers.net and at otternod. I think everywhere. Is that right, Ryan? Yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty much, much everywhere. everywhere. And then if you want to schedule some some FaceTime with Ryan, he opened an invitation on Calendly slash Otternod. Yeah, open. Uh, what is it called? Office hours. Office hours. You open can complain to him. You yeah. can be really angry about it. <laughs> I want to. I want to join you in one of these angry ones. I want to hear what yeah. people are saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. It would be nice to record one once, but it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right on, Greg. Cool. Yeah, and thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. That's not how we do the show. No. Oh my God. What do we do? There's more slides. There's more slides. Go through them, dude. Hold on. Like, comment, subscribe. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, you see, yeah. you got to skip go. through the deck. All right. Here we go. <laughs> ah, there it is. Animated for you. I got more. it. There's still more. There's I got right. it more. Maybe you've never watched the show to the very end. Why don't you advance it to the next slide? I'll do it all. One more Just slide. Just advance it. Here yeah. we go. Just oh, a big heartfelt God. thank you to everybody that's a sustaining member. Thank you for tuning in, you guys. See you guys on the very next episode. Stay tuned because Gary Vee Chuck is coming on at 2 p.m. See you guys then. Take us out with some music, Greg. That's the wrong music, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Aaron will cut to this at any point in time. Yep. Three, two, none. <laughs> Whoa, guys. <laughs>